I'm just so grateful for all that God's doing. In a world where we have Christians that are assembling and, and saying that Allah is God, Christians saying that, that's a lie. That's a lie. And that's not just Arabic for the God. Yahweh Elohim is God, and there is none other, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Yes. And if you're watching some of this stuff on Christian television, you need to beware because you're, you're bordering, if not have already passed, passed the mark of blasphemy. It's a scary thing today. And I don't care how big the ministry is, and I don't care how many books they have written, it doesn't make them right. We're still on the fire of God. This is our third week. How many are starting to feel a little fired up? <laughs> oh, I'm already gotten happy. You know, one of the things about Deuteronomy, or Deuteronomy, I'm getting ready to go to Deuteronomy. One of the things about Shavuot, it says we're supposed to rejoice before the Lord. How many did some rejoicing this morning? He kind of showed up before church started. One of the things I've, I've re realized about God, God pays no attention to clocks. And if the church would just realize that, how free we would get. I remember years ago, I pastored one church in, in, in Dixon, and, and everybody had, you know, it was when the digital watches were real big. Now, I know they come factory set at going off at midnight, but somehow or another at that church, they all went off at high noon. I paid no attention to it. To the chagrin of many of the men, and can he hear my watch beeping? God can't hear it either. He doesn't care. He will begin to move when he begins to move, and he will finish when he finishes. Because he's God, and he doesn't have to ask any church board about what he does. I'm ready for him just to be God. That's part of Shavuot. Last week, we discussed that the fire of God responds to the cry of God's people because of bondage. And if there was ever a time that the Laodicean church was ever established in the dispensationalism of, of God's timing, it is today. The church is in bondage, and what is so pathetic, most of them are in bondage and don't know it. You see, because if you'd ever realized it, you would cry out by reason of that bondage. And when you cry out... The fire of God begins to speak. Now, one of the things in Deuteronomy 16 and 12 that I thought very interesting about Shavuot, because always about Shavuot, we think of the day of Pentecost. We think of Mount Sinai, where the fire came. But here's a command of Shavuot that very few ever do. And Brother Radhouse mentioned it to me this week, and I went, hmm, I almost forgot about that. Look what it says here in verse 12. And thou shalt remember that thou wast a bondman in Egypt, and thou shalt observe and to do these statutes. You're going to remember the bondage. Shavuot is about remembering what God delivered you from and gave you the fire to get you out of. You see what, what the devil loves to do? He loves to get you to where you forget what the bondage was, and if you forget what it was and what it felt like, you'll wander right back into it. And for some of us, we have been in bondage for so long that it's the only place it feels like home. Tyranny of the familiar. Why do people stay in abusive relationships? That's all they know and nothing else feels right to them. That's why we need to be born again. I need to be born out of bondage. I was not created to be a bondsman in Egypt. I was not created to be under the slavery of the Pharaoh without, nor the Pharaoh within. Right. And you say, why is this so important? How many know the, the first Shavuot was because God had freed his people from a physical Pharaoh? The Shavuot, after the resurrection of Jesus, he had freed them from a spiritual Pharaoh. In the last days, that physical Pharaoh and the spiritual Pharaoh become one. And we have got to be set free from the final Pharaoh. And it's going to take the fire of God to do it. 
How many know that when Jesus comes back on a white horse and he comes back in the valley of Armageddon, he ain't going to be blowing kisses. There's going to be fire in his eyes and the word of God's going to come forth out of his mouth and it's going to devour the armies of the Antichrist. Well, if there's fire before and fire then, how about some fire now? I'm, I'm sorry. I'm already happy this morning. <laughs> Woo! Chuck, I'm taking your line. <laughs> this word bondsman in the Hebrew, habed. Now, it can, it, it's used many times in the Word of God. It means slave or servant. It could be bond servant, even a prophet or, or someone who is a servant of God. But in this context... You were a slave to the occult powers of this world. How many know that there, there, there is a nexus of evil? We had a president talk about the axis of evil, but there is a nexus of evil. It follows the line of Ham. One of Noah's sons. Turn to your neighbor and say, he wasn't kosher. Neither was any of his children. One of his sons, Mizraim, took the occult knowledge that, that was contained in the heart of Ham when he was on the ark and founded Egypt. Cush, the father of Nimrod, co-founded Babylon. And those two places became nexus of occult power. And if you follow down through, through history, and we can look at, the, at, at the, uh, the idol in the vision of Nebuchadnezzar. It started in Babylon. We see it in Egypt. We see it in Greece. We see it in Rome. And by the way, it's still in Rome. It's the greatest nexus of occultic power. How many know that there were two great occult libraries in the earth? When the Roman church split and there was the Greek Orthodox in Alexandria and then there was the Roman Catholic in Rome, they had the two greatest libraries of all secret knowledge, arcane knowledge on the planet. Alexandria fell and the library of Alexandria burned to a crisp, but the Vatican remained untouched. Wherever you have, where you have systems like this, you will have a multiplicity of principalities within those systems. Now, in many places, there's a principality over America, but there's also principalities over, over different sections of America. There's an amalgamation, especially when there's a nexus of occult power like there was in Egypt. There were multiple principalities carrying forth the work that Lucifer started in Babylon, and it was to enslave God's people. You know, I'm kind of frustrated because, you know, some of the Christian publishers that, that I've enjoyed, I mean, I know there's been a lot of shaking and baking going on with a lot of who owns who anymore in the earth. And did you know that there are a lot of Christian companies, publishing companies that are no longer owned by Christians anymore? That I've heard complaints from some of my students that run Christian bookstores that says, I can't have a credit line with so-and-so publishing anymore because they send me books on Buddhism and Zen and I've got to take those too because that's their parent company. And it's their parent company loaning me, loaning me the money to be able to carry the books and then they're saying, I've got to carry these too. I think we need to begin praying that some of our publishing companies and some of our, our, our record labels get free of Babylon, get free of Egypt. Because there's a tainting right now that's weaving through a lot of the Christian writing, that's weaving through a lot of the Christian music, because it goes back to who's on the board. Who's the ones that own it? In the body of Christ, there's only one person supposed to own it, and it's the Lord Jesus Christ. And if every person on that board, I don't care how slick they are with finances or with making money, if they have not bowed the knee to Jesus, they do not need to be there. Because it contaminates, it brings the influence. It brings the body of Christ back into bondage. And one of the reasons why Babylon was able to be built, one of the reasons that Egypt was able to be built, it was built on the backs of God's people. Yeah. I want to build the kingdom of God and not the kingdom of darkness. Whew. 
I'm so far into orbit, I may not be able to find my notes again. <laughs> it's amazing, Shavuot. First one, Moses was used of God to set his people free. And he said, one's going to come just like me. His name was Jesus. How many know Moses was an apostle? There's apostles in the Old Testament. Shocked to many apostles today. But apostle means one sent from the presence of God, one sent. He was sent by God to go do a task. There's also another one who came from the presence of God, who has seen the Father. His name is Jesus, and he came to set us free. But guys, remembering the bondage and our need for a deliver, for God to deliver us may very well be the divine mechanism to stir the fires of God's, the coals of God's fire within. I need him. I need him moving. I need him doing. I can't do it on my own. It is impossible unless God builds the house, those that labor, labor in vain. And some of the greatest edifices right now in the body of Christ all labored in vain to build them. I'm hearing people ask too many of the wrong things as we, as we begin to branch out and talk about revival and different things. They want to know, do you own your own building? And how big is your building? And do you have this? And do you have that? Who cares? What I want to know is, is the fire of God there? Are the people free? What good does it do to have the first assembly of Egypt and have 200,000 there all in bondage, running after whatever Egypt wants them to do so that Egypt can get rich or to have five that are free and on fire. We need to understand today, why do we need to remember the bondage? Why does it, when we remember it, why does it stir the coals? Number one, it kills pride. Pride before God will suffocate the fire of God within. Pride in any area of your life. Pride is what caused Lucifer to fall, and it is the chief mechanism that he uses that he can actually, he got one-third of the angels who were looking at God face to face, and they said, no, we like Lucifer better. Now, that was the original stuck on stupid. But could you imagine the pride that did that? If pride was able to do that in the lives and the hearts of angels that beheld the Father's face, what is pride going to do in you? If any man boasts in anything, let him boast in the Lord. I've seen great men of God get caught up in what they were doing in the body and they suffocated the fire of God within. Humility before God, recognizing I need him, will connect us to God's fire and cause the breath of the Holy Spirit to begin to blow upon the coals. James reminds us of this in James 4, 5 through 10. He said, do ye, did, do ye think the scripture saith in vain that the spirit that dwelleth in us lusteth to envy? But he giveth more grace, wherefore he saith, God resisteth the proud. God resisteth the proud. God resists the proud. He pushes it back. He pushes it away from the fire. He pushes it away from everything near his throne. But he gives grace to the humble. And it's with those words, gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit yourselves to God. If I don't, if I, if I pull down the pride and I break its back in my life and I humble myself before God, then and only then can I resist the devil. Because only in humbleness, in humility and brokenness can I submit myself therefore unto God. Then I can resist the devil and he will flee from me. Why? He can't connect to humility. He can't connect to brokenness. He can't, he, one of our secret weapons, guys, in spiritual warfare that absolutely freaks the devil out. Now, he's seen it happen a hundred billion times, but every time it freaks him out because he can't comprehend it. 
He gets a guy all puffed up in pride, gets him all in bondage and everything else, and the dude starts to repent. And the devil says, say what? It's, it's, it's something beyond his comprehension. He, he can't do it. He can't comprehend it. He can't wrap his head around it. He can't understand it one bit. And the moment you do it, he freaks out because he can't connect with it. What are you doing? Don't you realize what I've made you? Don't you realize how big and puffed up you are? Don't you realize all the work I put into you, putting you in all this bondage and making you think you're somebody when you have all my chains all over you and you're praying around saying, I'm somebody, I'm somebody, and you're all in these chains and how blind I've made you. But all of a sudden you start, you start humiliating yourself before God, humbling yourself before God and saying, God, I repent of this. The devil freaks out. He can't understand it. It is beyond his comprehension. It is one of our greatest secret weapons. No wonder today, from pulpits in America, they're saying there's no need to repent. Why are they preaching that? Because the spirit that is empowering them cannot comprehend repentance. We take the grace of God and now they're shaking the grace of God in God's face in rebellion saying, I can do whatever I want to do because there's grace. That kind of grace will send you to a devil's hell. God will reject it. Look what he says here, verse 7. Submit yourselves therefore to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning. Let your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and he will lift you up. That's part of what goes on with Shavuot. The only way you can get the fire is to be broken before God. We've got to see the state that we're really in. You know, you can't cry out for a deliver until you get this epiphany that you need deliverance. I wonder how many people Jesus passed by that one day when they were singing Hosanna that didn't sing that. Not to him. Not to him. How many in the places where he walked Men were in bondage. They were all messed up in their lives. Their families were broken, but yet they never reached out to touch him. Pride wouldn't let them. But there was one little woman with an issue of blood. The Bible says she had spent all that she had, and she crawled through a crowd with an issue of blood and touched a kosher rabbi and grabbed his zitzi. Did you know by the laws of Moses she could have been put to death for that? It made him ceremonially unclean, except for the power of God. She was desperate. She knew she was broken. She knew she needed help. She humbled herself before God, and she said, "If I, why did she grab his zitzi, the, the, the hem of his garment? That's the zitzi. On, on, on his talit, why did she grab those? Because Malachi had prophesied that when Messiah comes, he will come with healing in his wings, and the wings are the wings of the prayer shah. And if you know anything about a true zitzi, and, it's, and by the way, the stuff that you buy from Messianic stores, if it doesn't have a blue cord, it's not a zitzi. Because what you who's the blue cord? Jesus. And what does it all matter if Jesus isn't interwoven into all of it? <laughs> but she grabbed on to the commandments of God. She grabbed on to the name of God. She grabbed on to the promise of God, all intertwined with Jesus. And virtue flowed out of him into her because she humbled herself. She knew she needed deliverance. And the moment she reached out and grabbed, it came. <laughs> Say, Mike, why are you preaching all this stuff? Because we need deliverance. Lord knows we need help. We need help. The church in America needs help. I'm not sure what it's stuck on, but it ain't Jesus. It isn't the word of God. We're stuck on feelings. We're stuck on programs. We're stuck on feeling good about yourself before you're delivered. 
Well, if, you, if, if, we, if we use psychobabble to make you feel good about who you are before you're free, are you ever really going to get free? <laughs> They want us to rewrite the song, just as I am, and you're stuck with me. <laughs> it's not my plea. It's your predicament, Lord. <laughs> you can feel good about everything Jesus has done in your life. You can feel good about who you are in Christ. You can feel good that you're a new cre- creation in him. You can feel good that you're blood-bought, blood-washed, spirit-filled. That he now calls you his child because you've repented. You've pushed back darkness out of your life. You've embraced the cross. You made holiness a way of life. What's not to feel good about that? But yet we're trying, we're calling good evil and evil good. It's just okay. You ain't your whole ugly self. We're just going to put this garment of whatever on you. We're going we're to give you a shot of greasy grace and make you feel a whole lot better. No, repentance. Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. I believe there are are a good number of God's people beginning to cry out by reason of the bondage. I can't stomach what I see on a lot of Christian television. Not only that, I can't stomach a lot of what I know goes on behind the curtain. Come on. There's been some places I used to speak that the church held more than there's people that lives in Marshfield. But I also know what went on behind the curtain. (laughs) I couldn't stomach it anymore. Couldn't stomach it anymore. I'm tired of seeing preachers looking around and seeing, you know, who's, you know, which, which Rolex do you have? Amazon.com, baby. <laughs> I don't mind having a $500 watch if I pay $49.95 for it. Come on now. Don't mind that. Are you going to pay $500 for a $500 watch? I ain't stupid. <laughs> Come on. Just said and looking. You know, how big is your bishop's ring? How many diamonds you got on it? You don't drive a Lexus? Can you see the Pharisees arguing about who has the best donkey? Well, my saddle's handmade. It's Italian leather. <laughs> the best that Babylon has to offer. We need the fire of God because the fire of God is going to release God's wonders back in the earth. There were nine plagues on Egypt. Egypt called them plagues. God called them wonders. And when I read the book of Revelation, I see God pouring out all kinds of wonders on the earth. And Babylon is being destroyed. The devil's works are being destroyed. Things are being consumed. And people are still rejecting Jesus. But I see the church saying when they look at at the judgment of God being poured out on an unholy, ungrateful planet, they're saying, great are you, Lord. Great are your ways and your justice is pure. His wonders. Do you know why? The wonders of God are there for two reasons. One, to judge the spiritual forces that empower the bondage. He was judging the principalities over Egypt with all nine plagues. They worship the Nile. They worship this. They worship that. He judged them. True wonders in this day. Do you know that right now this morning, if you received a healing, it was because God was judging the spiritual force that, that caused that sickness or disease in your body? He judged it and said, I break your power. At the same time, he was releasing grace towards you. When God judges the devil, grace flows to his people. But if I won't let God judge the devil, then I end up in judgment. You either have grace, true grace, or judgment. 
For God to set his people free, there's going to be some shaking going on, some signs and wonders, not only as far as what we call signs and wonders, but some national ones, some global ones, because there are men on this planet that have set themselves up as gods. It has been that way since Nimrod, who ascended to become a god, the sun god. They believe that he had secret power, and, and we, we have seen it in Japan. You can see it throughout Asia. You can see it in Rome and Greece and Babylon. You can even see it in Judah. Remember when Herod, when he spoke in the book of Acts, and he waxed so eloquent that the people said, he has become as a god. How many know worms ate God lunch that day? Worms devoured him right before the people. It's like God is saying, are you stuck on stupid? Are you so f caught up with Rome and Egypt that you believe a man can become a God? But I'm here to tell you that God can become a man. His name was Jesus. God never started out as a man, but he so loved us to set us free, and we had such a propensity to worship a man, he said, I will come and I will take on the farm of a man to set you free. The second thing that wonders do, it causes God's people to fear God. Now, if you're seeing what are being called signs and wonders, and there's no fear of God, but just entertainment, it's not signs and wonders from God. Come on. I don't run after signs and wonders. Signs and wonders judge the devil. I take note of it, and I fear God. Why? Because there's false signs and wonders. We need to realize that we're getting ready to enter into an unprecedented period of spiritual warfare. Not where we're doing spiritual mapping. God's just got ready. He's laid out his map. You see, now, unless you're an apostle or a prophet, you cannot come up against a principality or power. You cannot do it. That's in the second heaven. You can't gather. There's no instruction from the word of God of how to astral project into the second heaven and go do warfare. It is a violation of God's word. We are not given authority in the second heaven. There is no place anywhere in the word of God where it instructs us to do it. Now, witches will talk about it going and astral projecting and fighting dragons and whatever. We are given authority in this realm. Here. Now, if a principality puts his finger down and begins to mess with my life, I can kick that finger on up out of my life because he's went into my domain. But dealing with principalities and powers is God's business. And when God's people begin to cry out, angels begin to go forth. Remember with Daniel, there was a principality that was the prince over Persia. I didn't see one Jew teleporting into the second heaven and wrestling that angel. Scotty, beat me up. I got to do some warfare. As Daniel prayed and fasted and sought the face of God, not only was that angel dispatched, but he was given backup. Michael, the archangel, showed up and began to show him what for and released and freed up that other angel to be able to go and deliver the message. Don't stick your head where it doesn't belong. When I was teaching on, on kingdom authority and warfare, one, two, or three is one of those. I think it was maybe two or three. Been a long time since I've taught those, hadn't it, Chuck? Um... I called it don't poke the bear. If all you are is you got a stick and it says don't go over there, there's bears, you go there and poke the bear, don't blame God if he rises up and has your lunch or has you for lunch. There's no instruction about us doing that. But signs and wonders from God and the fire of God are connected to the removing of principalities over geographical areas and from influencing the people of God. <laughs> See, I'm after the fire of God. Now, one of the, one of the, the, the nine plagues on Egypt, 
inhaled mingled with fire. Egypt wasn't too happy about that. The devil doesn't like the fire of God because the fire of God reminds him of the fires of hell and the lake of fire. He tries to be, he, he tries to paint himself as one of fire. No, he's one destined for the fire. <laughs> God's getting ready to displace some principalities and powers over America, some principalities over Marshfield. If you really knew what goes on in this community, it would make your hair stand on end. The things that are going on in homes and in the streets at night. The things Christians and deacons and pastors are involved with when nobody can see what they're doing would make your hair turn gray prematurely. We need deliverance. We need the fire of God. We need the fear of God. We need holiness. As the fire of God begins to fall on us and we are no longer influenced by those principalities, but we are influenced by Jesus, we give, the, we give heaven the right to displace that principality with a ruling angel from God. When righteousness is over the land. Now, we also need to realize not all signs and wonders are from God. Let's go to Deuteronomy 13 because I want to spend a little time here. Deuteronomy chapter 1. Or chapter 13 starting with verse 1, I'm sorry. I'll get it right here in a minute. This actually answers some questions. You know, why would God allow his people to be deceived? Why would God let a false prophet come in? Why would God let a little false signs and wonders in his church? Why would, God, why would God allow that? He's already answered it. It's in the book. Just because we haven't taken the time to read it doesn't mean he didn't answer it. If there rise among you a prophet or a dreamer of dreams and giveth thee a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder comes to pass, whereof he spake unto thee, saying, Let us go after other gods that thou, shalt, that thou hast not known, let us serve them. Thou shalt not hearken unto the words of the prophet or the dreamer of dreams, for the Lord your God proveth you to know whether you love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul. Ye shall walk after the Lord your God and fear him and keep his commandments and obey his voice, and ye shall serve him and cleave unto him and that prophet that dreamer of dreams shall be put to death because he has spoken to you to turn you away from the Lord your God which brought you out of the land of Egypt and redeemed you out of the house of bondage to thrust thee out of the way which the Lord thy God has commanded thee to walk in thou shalt put uh, out that evil away from thy midst guys well people aren't small well, there actually are right now people saying today let's go follow after another God his name is Allah that's actually a fulfillment of the scripture. And God calls him a false prophet. But how about doing it this way? We're going to take all this pagan stuff, put a little Christianese on it, and now it's a Christian thing to do. Always study the origin of what something is. Be good, be good, diligent students of the Word of God. Where do our holidays come from? Holiday is a slurred word that was originally holy day. You see, the devil has his holy days, God has his holy days, and never the twain shall meet. But if you do them as unto the Lord. God's already said in, in, in the Torah, said that's an abomination. Don't take the way of the pagan and do it unto me. It's an abomination. But now, you know, we can, it's now Christian to have tattoos. Because it's cool. No, it's just being a fool. In our history of Christianity, Paganism was dismayed that as Christianity began to take hold in America, tattoos stopped. 
Because in Torah, it says, thou shalt not get a tattoo, for I am the Lord. How much more plain do you get than that? All you need is boom, 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 in the background when you read that. Why? If you read the literature of the ink community, those who do, are into tattoos, it is religious. They say that a true tattoo artist is a shaman that is releasing something in your soul as he paints your body. It's an alchemy working. It's trying to turn that which you perceive as lead somehow or another you into gold. When God is saying the only way to get gold in your life, real gold, is have it tried by fire in my presence. We have had many a false prophet raise up within the body of Christ turning us from the ways of God. And God said, I, I wanted to test you to see whether, which one you liked more, me or popularity, me or that which was flowing in the current of society today. Do you want to stand out like a sore thumb? Because sometimes with the things of God, you got to. How can we be a witness if we're no different than those in bondage? Well, here's the reason. You get to do all this junk that they're doing, but I'm happy. Maybe deceived. We are having false prophets get up and say that there's no more thing as sin. There's no need to repent. There's no commandments of God. There's no ways of God anymore. You can just do what you want because of the cross. God calls them a false prophet. That's right. That's right. And they were a test to see which one you loved more, your flesh or the Lord of glory. Unfortunately, right now, the church is failing the test. We're going more in bondage in every day. Right. It's hard to tell the believer from the unbeliever anymore at the mall. That's right. well, that's truth. It's hard. You can't do it. And I don't care how much Jesus junk they wear or got plastered all over their cars because their actions and their attitudes and what they do are denying the very one they claim to proclaim because they're putting forth about another Jesus. Hear me and hear me well. Believers do not chase after signs and wonders. Now, it's interesting to me that when signs and wonders begin to happen, the sinners can't get in there because they got to go through all the angry Christians that are having to stand in line. If you want to find a sign and wonder, you should simply be able to look behind you and see the works of God in your life. That's the standard, not the exception. But you got to have the fire to do it. Let's go here to Mark chapter 16, verses 15 through 18. Boy, this is not coming out at all like I had anticipated in my head when I was putting this thing together this morning, but it's good. And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every living creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. These signs shall follow them that believe. Now there's a semicolon there, and I looked it up in the Greek, and that semicolon is not in the Greek. Hmm. It can be read this way. And these signs shall follow them that believe in my name. These signs shall follow them that believe in my name, that move in the name, that move in the one who represents that name. Signs are supposed to follow after you. You're supposed to be a sign and a wonder in the earth. And not by being so weird that it makes everybody wonder all around you. It's by being so free. It's by being holy. Holy. 
It's by having the blood of Jesus cleanse you of every sin. And you go through things that normally would drive people crazy. And you go through it with the praise. You've learned that praise is a weapon. That's one of the things we've been trying to teach you. Praise is a weapon. We think, well, I don't feel like praising this morning. Great. Turn it into a baseball bat and beat the absolute snot out of what's been harassing you all week. It's a weapon. It will turn back the enemy. Jehoshaphat learned when they were facing all these armies. He didn't send in his best warriors, or maybe he did. God said, send out praisers in the front. Now, let me know you're sitting there with a tambourine. That doesn't mean you have the muscles for a sword. You know, all the honors were sitting back in the back line, and all the praisers and worshipers were out. Because although the victory is ours, the battle is the Lord's. And they sent out the praisers that day. And it so confounded the enemy that they began attacking each other. Praise is a weapon. The Bible tells us in the book of Hebrews that we offer up the sacrifice of praise. It ain't a sacrifice if you feel like doing it when you come to church. You want to give a sign and a wonder? It's when you feel so low that you got to look up to see the bottom of a worm. And you start praising God in the midst of that. You are a sign and a wonder to the devil and it confuses him. And the Bible says, I will push back the enemy when you praise me. Sometimes you can't even pick up the sword of the Spirit until you at least get some praise out your mouth when you don't feel like it. Signs and wonders are supposed to follow after you. Now, Mary and I have lived out some of these things. We've cast out devils. We spoke in new tongues. We've had some serpents come into the church. Didn't quite look like a serpent, but they were kind of snaky. We've been poisoned. We had arsenic work out of our system. We've been poisoned before. And have heavy metals actually work their way out of the skin. God said, let's do it that way instead of having it kill you. Wasn't any fun, but it was sure a whole lot better than dying. That's right. Sign of wonder. We're going to lay hands on the sick and they're going to recover. Some of them sick in head, some of them sick in body. Some of them just sick. Need deliverance. You're not supposed to chase after these things. You run after God. You let him fill you full of fire. You keep that fire stirred up on the inside of you. And then you start watching what God does through you. And he can only do through you what he's freed you. In those areas that you're free, you can move. That's why we've got to humble ourselves. We've got to cry out by reason of the bondage. I've been feeling kind of free here lately, but I'm not completely free yet. When I'm completely free, we're going to have to replace that camera with one on somebody's back because they're going to have to follow me around here because I'm going to end up being a wild man. I, I, have, I used to be that way when it was just a mic and just recording. I could be in the back row preaching and over here. I might go outside in the parking lot and preach for a while. You don't know. But because of that camera, I'm stuck right here. I'm getting ready to get some freedom. Glory to God. Where God's going to send someone in here who knows how to operate that, and we're going to put a battery pack on him and say, Go, Bubba. Yeah. If you can keep up with a man, try. I want to be free. I seek after freedom. I seek after the fire of God. I seek after his face. I seek to know him. I seek to know his ways. And the result is, is signs and wonders. If you seek after signs and wonders, you will always be deceived. Because in the last days, Jesus warns us there will be signs and wonders that will even deceive the very elect. Why? They start running after signs and wonders. Signs and wonders knock out principalities, begin to burn stuff out of your life, but for those in paganism, it gets their attention. It ought to be old hat for you. 
Our attitude is, you want to see some signs and wonders, get about 20 of us together praising God and seeking his face. We'll get you some signs and wonders. Somebody in Buddhism comes in, they're going to get a wonder, all right. God's going to do something to get their attention. Some of the meetings where I'm hearing right now up in Canada where there's manifestations of the fire of God. I had had Kevin call me this one week, and there was this one that as they're praising and worshiping, the roar of fire began to come over the PA systems. And so the guy's trying to adjust. Well, what's going on? What's weird going on? He turned the PA system off, and it continued. Well, why'd that happen? There were some First Nations people in there that didn't know Jesus. They were pagan. They had been talked into coming to church. And for the first time in their life, they saw a wonder that made them believe in the Jesus of this book. We all want to gather together, just you know, all of us that knows Jesus. We want some signs and wonders so that we can be entertained. They're for unbelievers! So is that telling us if we're after signs and wonders, does that make, make us an unbeliever? Possibly. Seeking after the, you're seeking after the loaves and the fish instead of the guy who prayed over it and <laughs> made it multiply. Come on. Divine balance. That's why this is a time of humbling ourselves before God, of crying out for the bondage. You see, our families can be a whole lot better than they are right now. Some of it's good. I mean, some of us, I know we got some, we got, oh, I like, you know, I'm comfortable with some things and some things are good. The largest room in the world is the room for improvement. And all of us need improvement. I'm starting to get healthier. Starting to get a little thinner, but how many know there's a whole lot of room for improvement? I could lose 100 pounds and it not do me any harm. There's room for improvement. There's room for improvement of more joy of the Lord in your house. Healing in your bodies. Children on fire for God. Children coming home. See, because your children carry your seed of, of your future generations, and they need to serve God too. What you do now can affect them. That's why God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That when God blesses, it can be up to a thousand generations. That you getting right with God right now, if the Lord should tarry another thousand years. Now, how this world's going to keep spinning for another thousand years, I have no idea. But let's say it just happens. What you're doing today, what you have said in your heart today to follow after God could be affecting people a thousand generations from today. That's one of the lessons that we learn with Abraham. That every Gentile that gets saved, the blessing of Abraham has come on him. All because thousands of years ago, there was one dude named Abraham that God said, yo, all that stuff in Babylon, that ain't the way. I'm the way. There's no other God but me. And he said, sure, I'll do it. I'll leave, I'll leave my family business that I was getting ready to inherit, that I've trained my whole life for. I'll walk away from all of it just to know you, the real God. And it so blessed Yahweh that he said, why don't you just go ahead and let the world call me your God. And to this day, he's known as the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If he can do that, what could you do? What could you do? I'm going to end with this. There's a guy named James Dobson. I may just love him when, when he talks and stuff. His grandfather prayed every day, not only for his children, but his children's children. I believe it was his grandfather, not his dad. Every day. He saw his... I, I think James Dobson is probably the only one in his family, or maybe it might have been his dad, the only one in his family that's not a preacher. All the men surrendered to ministry. All the women married preachers. And then there was James Dobson, which probably is preaching more than all of them combined, and has paid a price, had his own ministry taken away because he wouldn't compromise truth. Yeah. We'll be to that board.
But look at the difference it made because one man prayed. Humbled himself before God. If God should tarry 50 years from now, is your family going to point to you and said, the curse stopped there. The pain stopped right here with great-grandma, great-grandpa, or great-great-grandma, great Something changed with that generation that God touched them and our family was never the same again. What used to be a curse is now a blessing. And all of us are so hungry for God, we can't stand it because great-great-grandma and grandpa was humbled before God and sought his fire. And a family that used to be full of all kinds of stuff is now full of preachers and educators that are true to the word and politicians that there's no lies in that won't compromise truth for a vote that begin to change things. Oh, how we need that. And it can start with us right here today. We need the fire. We need the fire. Now, today's a little bit different. We actually had the altar call before the preaching. <laughs> Won't you come? <laughs> God just moved. Where I was wanting us to get after I preached, we got before I preached. How many feel like that's, that's true? Why did God do it that way? I don't know. I don't know. He's afraid I'd mess it up with the way I was preaching. I don't <laughs> Let God be God. I was kind of wondering today if I was even going to get to preach. You know, I'd I do this next one, week after next, because next week Pastor Rodhouse is preaching. I'm going to be in Pocahontas, Arkansas. But guys, God's doing something. Grab on to it. Don't let this be another sermon. Don't let this be just another service. Grab on to it and say, I'm going to take some of this fire home. I may just have one coal, but I'm going to go home and go, <sighs> you know, put a little prayer on it. Put a little dedication on it. Put a little word on it. <sighs> Let it blaze into a fire because of the dedication you put to it. Because God's doing something. He's doing something right here, right now. A year from now, if we do what we're supposed to do, what a difference it's going to make in Marshfield. I'm waiting for teachers to say, you know, the state requires me to teach evolution, so let me teach you about the goofy concepts of evolution, how it's not true. <laughs> Man thinks he comes from a monkey, and a monkey thinks he came from an amoeba. And I, I, I talked to the apes out at the at Springfield Zoo, and they don't think so. <laughs> Come on. It's time to see things change. And how do we get things to change? Change me, God. Change me. Change me. Change me. And then let what you do in me change the world around me. Yes. Father, make it so in this day and this hour. Father, I just loose an anointing right now. Father, that which you have begun in this place of, of us entering into a new level of consecration, a new level of dedication, a new level of brokenness before you, that we could understand your holiness and understand your fire, Father. Father, right now, I just pray over. Father, I, let, I blow the breath of prayer over the coals that you have stirred today. And, Father, I believe that they're not going to dim this week, but you're going to increase them. That we're going to catch the devil at his tactics and begin to use them against him. Let us be ever so aware of the tactics of the enemy, the ones that so easily beset us. And, Father, turn those stumbling blocks into stepping stones this week, we ask. In Jesus' name.